All right, boy, appreciate you, man. Amen. Wow. Okay, good. Amen, 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 amen. Listen, I'm so fired up, I can't stand it. Um, I'm celebrating. What about you? Another day of living. You remember the old rare earth? Rare earth. I just want to celebrate. God's given us breath in our lungs this morning. Are you fired up about that? This is the day the Lord's made. We can rejoice, right? Be glad in it. But that's not to say there's a tear in every heart, right? I mean, we're, but we've got a man of sorrows that loves us and wants to walk with us and encourage us and comfort us. But men, I'm here to love on you this morning, okay? Anybody have too much encouragement and love right now? Anybody? I want to talk about generous living, not, not just about money. I mean, money to me is just, it's just money, right? I want to talk about generous living. What does it mean to have an attitude and a mindset of just, when I see somebody, when I get up in the morning, I want to thank God for today and try to be a blessing, right? Not just be blessed, but how can I be a blessing and invest in other people? Of course, it's always good to ask the why question, right? The motivation What's behind generous living? Well, I think God's always a good place to start, right? God gave, God gives, and that's how he wants us to live. God gave, God gives, and that's how he wants us to live. Jesus showed up not to be served, but to serve, and he gave his life on the cross so he might give us salvation today. The Holy Spirit showed up at Pentecost and gave holy boldness to the followers of Jesus to share the gospel. So the Holy Spirit gave, and the Holy Spirit gives today comfort, wisdom, encouragement, guidance. Wow. Ron and I were walking Wednesday, and I showed him these Trinity trees, right? Well, let me tell you something, guys. The Trinity's into generosity. They're chest bumping and saying, wow, how can we bless people? How can we give? We gave, we give, and that's how we want our sons and daughters to live. The Trinity is a community of generosity. So I was thinking about our time and praying about it. I thought, wow, just simply out of gratitude, what a great motivation to give, right? I mean, if I'm truly grateful for salvation, grateful for my family, grateful for my health, grateful for just having breath in my lungs, I can't help but erupt in generosity. Don't you love being around people that you feel like they're other-centered? When you look at them in the eyes, they're, they're giving generously of your, their attention. Don't you love being around those people? You don't feel like they're sucking life out of you. You feel like they're energizing you and you're giving, they're giving life to you. I believe that has something to do with the abundant life, don't you? The abundant life is a generous living life. Jesus said, I came to give you that kind of, that kind of life. And it's the, um, it's the sowing and the reaping, right? Generosity is investing in people with our time, our influence, our affluence. It's investing, it's sowing, and it's reaping. And we know the parable of the sower, right? Sometimes it falls on good soil. Sometimes it falls on bad soil. But we trust God, right, to bring the harvest. So it's not up to us to decide who we're going to bless and love on. It's up to us to trust God that he's going to send the people in our life that we can generously love. So he gave... He gives, and that's the way he wants us to live, generous living. So let's talk about time. Time may be our greatest asset. So Jesus showed up in the fullness of time, and Jesus didn't have any money. Did y'all notice that? He didn't have any money. He was a generous liver. Liver, not liver, but you know what I'm saying. Jesus lived generously with his time. In fact, you remember he was teaching on taxes one day. By the way, that's that's coming up, isn't it? He was teaching on taxes one day, and somebody had to give him a coin. 
Jesus didn't have any money. He didn't have any. This used to be plastic. I think they're metal now. What is this? Jesus, yeah, Jesus didn't have any money. He was, he was rich, yet he became poor that we might become rich. It doesn't make sense. He left glory to give us his glory and to love on us and to be generous. And so I took this, I like acronyms, so I took the word time, and I want to give you some thoughts around how we can be generous with time. So T, T is to trust God that what I invest, he will bless. Time is to trust God that what I invest, he will bless. Whether I invest time in somebody, whether I invest influence or cash or affluence, I can trust God that he will bless what I invest. And then the I in time, if we're thinking about being generous with our time, the I is to inspire others. Gentlemen, don't you just love it when you meet somebody and they bring energy to the conversation? They bring, they bring relational um, excitement, relational engagement. You know, it's like a Tesla, right? I understand if you don't plug those things in, they don't work very well. We want people that are plugged into Jesus. We want to be plugged into Jesus. We want to, we want to bring that inspiration that energy. The M in time is I want to mentor the mind by God's grace. Men need truth, right? The enemy every day is trying to cloak our mind in lies. And so when we're investing in people with our time, we need to mentor the mind. We need to remind people, listen, we've got an operating system right here and we need constant updates, right? We need constant downloads, the old King James version is we need to renew the mind. We, we got an operating system and we need to hit that yes install. No, it's a hassle to install it, isn't it? But I've noticed my phone gets bugs and sometimes my laptop crashes. I lost five hours of work the other day. I got in the flesh almost. I think I did. I mean, because I hadn't, I called my son-in-law who's a lot smarter than I am. I said, son-in-law trip, what's going on? He said, well, have you updated? Your operating system. No, I don't have time to hit the update button. I wonder if Satan's so happy that we don't have time to renew our mind. We don't have time to update that operating system because we're too busy trying to do other things with the, that, that, are, that are maybe good but not necessary. So mentoring the mind, guys, and then E, engaging the heart engaging the heart. So my friend David called me 10 years ago. We've been friends almost 30 years now. You ever had a family member that you were burdened for? They needed your time, but they didn't necessarily want to give you time. Maybe you have somebody right now, a, a child, somebody you work with, a neighbor, a family member. You want to give them time, but they don't necessarily want it. You want to invest, but they're kind of resisting. Well, David called me and he said, would you just pray with me about Nathan? He's away from the Lord. Can we just pray? Prayer is always a great place to start, isn't it? In fact, not just start, but continue and never stop. Because prayer is one of those secret weapons God's given us. And so we prayed for Nathan. And we had this idea, let's have a book club, book club. And the book club was just an excuse to get time together. See, we change when we're in the right environments. It's like my, my wife's greenhouse. I've got a brown thumb, Rita's got a green thumb. And you look at that greenhouse and guess what? Everything's green. I've watched more YouTube videos about green stuff because my wife wants to you, you know, you want to love what your people you love love, right? And so I'm trying to love this. And um, but one thing in this in this greenhouse video, it said he's got these little twigs called suckers. Isn't that a great word? 
And these twigs suck the life out of the vines. You got to prune them back for the fruit to come out and for the, for the main branches to grow. But anyway, the point, I was, <laughs> the, the point I was making was that investing in Nathan over time. Re, so we started with books like Tony Dungy and Truett Cathy. And we, and we made it easy and exciting to, to learn. And then about four years into this, see, generous living is, is for the long haul. It's not a quick fix. It's not a sowing and reaping takes time, right? An orchard of apple trees and an orchard of, of beautiful fruit, that doesn't happen overnight, does it? The Bible says something about putting our roots deep down by the waters of the Lord. And then over time, in due season, we will bear fruit. So I want to encourage you men right now, you may not be seeing the fruit relationally that you want to see in the person you're investing in. You just keep loving them. You keep encouraging them. You keep being generous with your time, your prayers, your resources, your influence, your affluence. So we're about four years into this book club and he reads something. So now we're in man in the mirror. We've graduated to Patrick Morley. And he reads, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. He says, you know what? I think I, think I really believe that. And we're all <laughs> trying not to get too excited. And then about a year later, his dad and stepfather do an intervention. Says, we believe you're an alcoholic. We need your keys. He says, you're right, I am. And he checked in for 90 days. He hadn't had a drink in four years. Two year, uh, a year and a half ago, my wife and I went to his wedding. This knocked down, gorgeous, beautiful model, PhD from memory. And I'm like, Nathan, is she blind? What's going on here? <laughs> is God good or what? Does God take broken things and make them beautiful or what? Does God take your generosity and expand it way beyond what you could ever ask or think or what? We sow. He brings the increase, right? We sow, he causes it to grow. We sow our love, we sow our time, we sow our affluence, we sow our influence, and we trust him to bring the increase. Jesus didn't have any money, but he had time. And he loved well. God gave, God gives, and that's how he expects us to live. And then we have influence, guys. Every one of us have influence, either good influence or bad influence. Am I using my influence to bless others or am I using my influence just to bless me? And, and God said, okay, Boyd, I put you in a position in your home, in your work, in your neighborhood, and I want you to be an influence for me. I want you to take those four son-in-laws. So I know we're taping this, guys. So four son-in-laws. Here's what I'm about to say. I want you to take those four son-in-laws that don't that have a lot of energy, but sometimes not as much sense, right? But have a lot of energy. And I want you to love on them where they are. I don't want you to change them. That's the work of my spirit. I'm going to change them. I want you to support them and love them in what they do. And trust me to move them to where they need to, to be. And guys, you know what I'm learning? Love is the best accountability. These son-in-laws love each other. They absolutely love each other. Now, I'll take them fishing. I'll take them hiking. I'll take them you know, on these different trips. You know, I have learned if you pay, they will come. We're having dinner next Wednesday night, so once a month we have dinner. Now, we have to have dinner at 8.30 because they have to help their sweeties put the short people to bed, right? Now, about 8.30, my brain's about half gone, right, or I almost checked out. But when you love somebody, you love what they love, and right now they love having dinner at 8.30. So I get an extra cup of coffee about 6 p.m., get ready. And we sit around. And then I say, now we're going to quit snorkeling the conversation. We're going to move beyond sports and the economy. Okay, you ready? We're going deep. What does it look like for your wife to be loved on right now by you? What does that look like? And then I stop talking. 
So guys, I've got a little bit of time. I've got a little bit of influence. I've got a little bit of money. And I want to use it. I want to reserve time for those who are going to sit in the reserve section at my funeral. I want to reserve time for those who are going to sit in the reserve section at my funeral. So Wednesdays, the son-in-laws know I don't have appointments on Wednesdays. And every Wednesday, I'll talk to at least one of them, either in person or by phone. You know, I had four daughters, didn't have four sons, but now I do. Now, some of them are all screwed up in their college football loyalties, but you know what? You can't have everything, right? You love them even when they're different. Now, Gail Jackson gave me some good wisdom. Did Gail Jackson ever give you some good wisdom? Hey, boy, now come here, boy. Come here. Let me tell you something. I think you're being a little too aggressive in how you're helping people with your influence. You need to guard your good name. You need to guard your reputation. Well, you know what? 100% of the time, Gail Jackson told me something. There was always some truth in what he told me. And Gail was right. We need to be wise about how we use our influence to help others. But I don't think, Gail, you would disagree right now if I said there are those that are on the margins that we need to get out there with them where it's messy. And we need to love on them and encourage them and help them because that's what Jesus did. Men, who are you loving on in the messy margins? See, if Paul had not had Ananias... If Ananias had not laid out his influence and said, this old boy, I'm not sure about him. He's, he's pretty crazy. He sure hated Christians, but boy, he talks about this road to Damascus and he talks about seeing the Lord and he's blind right now. So at least he's blind. He can't hurt me too bad, I guess. I'm going to take him under wing and I'm going to take him up here because God told me to. So men, right now in your life, who's in the messy margin that God's saying, I want you to get out there with them where it's messy? Give them empathy, not judgment. Because when we give them empathy, empathy doesn't mean we agree with what they're doing. Empathy means we want to help them get out of what they're doing. And that we want to understand them, that we want to love them. And we want to give them our influence to help give them a hand to help lift them up. So God gave, and he still gives, and that's how he expects us to live. Generous living. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's a mindset. It's a lifestyle. And don't you love being around people that bring energy to the conversation? <laughs> I, tell our, I tell our little team of seven at the National Christian Foundation, I said, listen, you save your drama for your mama. Listen, we, we're, this is a no drama zone. What I want you to bring is energy. I want you to bring solutions. I want you to bring opportunities. We're going to have challenges, but we're going to cover each other's back. We're going to get through it together. That's a generous, that's generous living, men. Amen. Bring it on. That's all right. He's, get, he's downloading his operating system there. He's getting... So generous with our time, generous with our influence and generous with our affluence. Now, the poor in our country are richer than most of the people in the world. Y'all notice that? Our, our definition of poor in our country is richer than most people in the world. It's crazy. I got, I've got to read you this because I don't want to screw it up. Is that okay? We're talking about affluence and being generous with our affluence. You ready? We got this, Gary? We got it? All right. Money is a servant for God's purposes, not a master over our fleshly desires. I hear this next part all the time. Listen, even the motivation of wanting to be rich so you can be generous is not healthy. A better approach is to be generous before you become rich, and then you can be trusted by God to be rich. So, guys, generosity is not, well, I'm going to work real hard and get rich so then I can be generous. 
Hey, Jesus didn't have any money. Generous living is taking our time and our influence and whatever resources we have and saying, God, here's my fishes. Here's my loaves, Jesus. Multiply them by the Holy Spirit. And he does it. And all of a sudden, 5,000 people are being fed, and we're like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? The Holy Spirit's running with this because we're holding it with an open hand. We don't wait, we don't wait to get rich before we be generous. We be generous now, so one day we might be rich and still be exceedingly generous. He said it's something like this. Be faithful with a little, then you can be trusted with much. But, guys... Here's what's so cool about God's economy. In addition to our systematic generosity with, with stuff, with resources, with money, don't you just love those spontaneous opportunities to give? And here's the one I enjoy the most. Now, this is just me, okay? This is just me. I love the spontaneous giving when I don't feel led to give money. So Peter and John, they're going to church. You know the story, Acts chapter 3. They're on the way to the prayer meeting. Sometimes I'm so busy in religious activity, I don't have time for those on the margin. I got to get to church. I got to get to prayer meeting so I can pray for those that are poor. They're on the way to church. And just like Skid Row in a major city in America, the beggars are lined up fundraising. Alms, alms for the poor. The Holy Spirit pricks their heart. I know we're on the way to prayer meeting. We're going to be late to prayer meeting, but I think God wants us to be the answer to the prayer right now. Silver and gold have we none. They didn't have any money either. They're just following Jesus' example. Silver, silver and gold have we none. But in the name of Jesus, men, in the name of Jesus, men, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk because Jesus, he heals. And don't you love it when spontaneously you're with another human being, their heart's hurting, there's pain. Behind those bad decisions is a, hurt, is a, is a heart of hurt. There's a whole lot of heart of hurt behind those bad decisions. And you can look at them and say, they, th they think they need money is what they think they need. But you can look them just like Peter looked them. He fixed the King James Version. He fixed his eyes on them. Don't you love it when a man looks in your eyes? That means he cares about you. He wants to know you. He loves you. He fixed his eyes on that man. And he reached out his arm. And he said, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. He gave him Jesus to heal his heart. Men. We, can, we, we are filthy rich with unlimited access to the riches of all riches, which is salvation in Jesus. And we can give that gift to that hurting heart to be healed. Is that beautiful? He gave. He gives. And that's how he wants us to live. The Trinity's chest bumping, guys, around generosity. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, they can't believe that they've got us out there as generosity ambassadors with our time, our influence, and our fluence. So when I was a young man, I had a whole lot of energy, but not near as much sense as I needed. But I did know this. I had time, and there were times I overworked. I'll, I'll confess. I, there were times I, I – maybe, maybe there were times I needed to work that hard. But my daughter –
wanted to play softball. Now, guys, hate's a strong word because, you know, but I don't really like softball. But I like my daughter. I love Rebecca. I used to tell Rebecca she's the oldest. I said, Rebecca, whatever age you are, we're practicing. I've never had one. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. She's about 10, 9 or 10. She wants to play softball. So I'm the assistant coach. <laughs> Whew, that was a relief. I was the assistant coach. So I'm playing third base coach. She hits the ball. She's running around third. I'm, I'm just fired up. I'm high-fiving. I'm, gosh, go, 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 go. She scores, and the ump says, she's out of there. And I'm like Bobby Cox. I'm like, what do you mean she's out of there? She's out. He said, he said, young man, you got out of the coach's box. You can't do that. I showed up. Didn't know what I was doing. But God filled in the gaps. And I even screwed up. But my daughter hugged me anyway. So I got a plaque. In appreciation to Boyd Bailey, assistant coach. For your time. Can I pray for you? Oh, Lord. Ah. We love you so much, Lord. And men, I know there's a tear in every heart. I know you're concerned about things. You still feel guilty about some things in the past. You're worrying about some things in the future. Men, would you lift whatever burden that is that's on your heart this morning? Would you lift it to the Lord right now? Just say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for bearing this burden with me. I want to yoke with you. I want to get into your yoke. Here's my burden, Lord. Would you just lift it to him in your heart? And in place of that burden, would you receive his blessing of love, encouragement, forgiveness, healing? Would you just receive that back down into your heart and thank you for that? Father, thank you for these men. Thank you for healing our hearts and lifting our burdens. Lead us to live generously for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. guys let's kind of pull together i like the pull from the floor just for a second i mean boyd great job that is what a tremendous topic thanks for the fresh bread um so what'd you talk about something that hit you something around the table that said wow that was a good reminder and no, i'm gonna change something on that this really hit anything guys a, a key takeaway is um to love someone is to love what they love so whether that's your spouse, your kids, your coworker, um, and we use college football as the example. How many of your wives or spouses absolutely hated college football when you started watching it? But the imprint that you left on them, they've become to they be they started to love what you love because not because they love football, but because they love you. So that's a key takeaway. That's awesome. Yeah, who's in your reserve section, right? 
uh, at your funeral? How much time are you spend in there? How, how much time are you investing there? Where does time, influence, affluence all come together in that little circle? All right, somebody else. One thing that the verse that had come to mind when uh, when you started talking was the uh, the woman who gave you know the two cents gave more than all the rich. Why? Because she gave all she had. That's all she had. Time, money, whatever. Just give your two cents and. All right. Being generous with my kids, you know, the, the impact of what a softball coach, you know, my daughter, especially she, she desires my time painting her toenails or, you know, and I can tell you that it never ends, right? My daughter married with a 10 year old herself loves to spend time together. We just, it's up to me to be creative in how we do that. Um, somebody else? Take one more, maybe, huh? I'm going to make the assumption that we're, if we unpack this message, that we could live more generously than we are doing today. The key question I'm walking away with, and I just shared at the table, is what are the three things in my life right now that I'm not doing that's preventing me from doing that. Take the time this weekend to unpack that and then have the courage to share it with someone at your table and say, can you help me with this? Whether it's an accountability thing or it's some form of working with someone else on it. Because I guarantee you on the other side of doing this, you will live more generously and it will have a generational impact with those who are God's put in your path. That's great, Tom. That's great, thanks. Um, you know, boy, you dropped a lot of neat bombs on us, right? The, the reset of the mind was fantastic. I love the vision of the Trinity chest bumping in generosity and wanting us, now we're their generosity agents, right? Uh, and so, guys, look at that verse. Look at that first verse, uh, Proverbs 11, 25, the generous will prosper and those who refresh others will be refreshed. You know, that's true, right? <laughs> that's where we want to live, be generous. And then therefore we get refreshed. Uh, absolutely positively fantastic. Boyd, I know you got a closing thought or two, right? <laughs> so guys, if a man gives a talk on generous living, he better model it, right? So I brought you a gift. So this is called the spiritual life of a leader. And um, I, I really felt God's pleasure writing this book. And uh, writing for me is therapy. I feel like God makes me a better version of myself through writing. And whatever your gift is, as you exercise that, you know what I'm talking about. You feel God's pleasure and he uses your gift to make, make you a better version of yourself. So this just talks about some of the ideas around abiding in the Lord and what does it mean to really listen to God? You know, uh, silence is the language of God and he wants us to become fluent in silence. And the best way to learn the language is immersion, right? Immersion in silence. So I give some practical ideas in this. And again, these are, this is a gift for you. So I brought 50 of these. And then um, I wrote these during the pandemic, Refreshed by God. So there's 100 devotionals in this one, daily, 100 daily devotionals, where this is, uh, this is more of a chapter book. This is a devotional book. So I brought, I brought 50 of these. So if you could it, take one or the other, and then I understand some people won't take any. That's fine. So as everybody kind of mingles out, if there's still some left, I don't want to take any books home with me. Um, so feel free if there's some left to take a second one, but I just love being with you. Um, once a year, I don't know what, well, let's, let's try, let's, let's get our people to talk to your people. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I got. That's all. Thank you. Appreciate it, boy. Let's.